welcome to another episode of Banking Matters. I'm Lindsay Hughley, your host, and joining me today is Brent Farley. Brent is a banking regulatory attorney who helps banks and fintechs develop new services and business lines. He helps bankers develop safe and innovative ways to reach new and old customers so that they can focus on serving their customers and not worry about running afoul of the law and bank regulations. He has a long background in banking, including experience in commercial lending, as a compliance officer, a banking attorney, and now manages Farley Law, a law firm focused on providing services for community banks and fintech companies. Welcome, Brent. Thank you so much for being here today. I am super excited to jump into your topic today. Hey, thanks, Lindsay. It's great to be here. I appreciate you inviting me and uh, excited to, to have this conversation. Yeah. So first, as always, at, here at Banking Matters, we love to ask our guests how you got started in the financial services industry. Oh, that, that was a while ago now. So I always had an interest in finance, um, all, all, even through high school and into college. And so get, getting out of college prior to law school, I, I landed a position at Zions Bank. They had a national real estate department at the time. They were doing commercial lending across the U.S., I uh, really got to get my feet wet in banking and in commercial commercial real estate there prior to going to law school and managed to jump right back into banking after that as a compliance officer and then then full-time attorney with a, a bank and then a, a banking law firm. That's awesome. Um, and I think it's kind of funny how hand-in-hand -hand finance and law go together. There's been so many people as I've aged in the financial services industry that it's just you either are best friends with a banking regulatory <laughs> attorney or you're b both of the same thing and honestly i feel like what you just described compliant being a compliance officer and an attorney too such a good combination right so the, the thing about banking and financial services is just about every service you provide is just it's embodied in a legal arrangement of some sort so it's all, it's all on paper, it's all on agreement, it's, it's promises that, that need to be kept. Um, and then, you know, that part about, you know, liking or, or hating your attorney. Well, I, I found that uh, true in being a compliance officer as well. Either everybody loved you because you figure out a way how to, how to let them do what they wanted, or, or you had to tell them no because there, there was a law or regulation um, or, or some other issue that just, just made it impossible. Uh, so, you know, we try to take the tack to that, to take to stay along the lines of making things possible for for our clients and our our bank customers, uh, but every once in a while there there are some times that we have to say, no, we just there's just not a way to do that, <laughs> at least not right now. <laughs> so. Yes, and sometimes it is the most hated person in the bank. Sometimes just a little bit, but <laughs> you just got. I mean, just doing your job. Um, so, um, I wanted to talk with you today, um, about what are some alternatives to banking as a service? I know that you work with community banks and fintechs. Can you help us get some background into some alternatives to what banking, what would work for banking as a service? Right. So, so that topic for me, uh, started around, uh, 2003, we started to see a number of enforcement actions and other orders from, from regulatory agencies. Uh, target banking as a service arrangements. Um, so, so some of the issues that we saw there were, were kind of lack of transparency uh, because basically if you're in a BAS arrangement, you have uh, a third party that's going out and they're providing a lot of services for a bank. They're, they're essentially offering uh, a banking service to customers and using the bank charter, but the bank isn't doing much uh, of anything in, in terms of services. And so, uh, because that area was seeing a lot of regulatory scrutiny uh, with some of our clients, we started to look at, okay, what, what's a good alternative to that? And so we started looking at restructuring some of the arrangements or some of the new arrangements uh, to where the bank was taking on a lot more responsibility, uh, where the FinTech group could offer their expertise, uh, where, where the bank probably didn't have it um, or didn't have the, the manpower to, to kind of take care of that all. Um, but you can still let the bank be in the driver's seat in terms of controlling its risk, um, in terms of you know, seeing who the new customers were, in terms of seeing what the new loans were like on their books. And so you go from a kind of a model where, uh, the bank is sitting in the back seat and is taking all the risk, but really can't control it as it's coming to the bank, uh, to putting the bank in a position where it can see the risk that it's taking on 
and can, can look at it, can monitor it, and, and has a better handle on it and still allow the fintech group to do what they're really good at on, on the technology and marketing and, and other aspects of the, the arrangement. And so as you've kind of navigated um, looking at these agreements, have you found it, have you found both sides, the banks and the fintech companies, have you found them amicable to those types of changes and kind of the rearranging? Because honestly, what you're describing sounds like the best option for both parties. It, well, well, it depend. I mean, lawyer's favorite answer depends, right? So um, <laughs> it, won't, it won't fit for every circumstance. Right. Um, but, but for a case where you're looking at marrying a, a tech, technology service and a marketing offering, and, and expertise in a new industry and bringing that into a bank, you don't have to go with the full banking as a service uh, type of offering. It, it requires some more collaboration between the bank and, and the FinTech partner. And, and yes, it is well-received um, where it works. It, you know, it won't work all the time, but uh, in a lot of cases it can, where you don't necessarily need to go to the level of risk that you might have in a banking as a service range. Gotcha. And so you had mentioned putting the bank more in control of the risk that they're taking on. Can you kind of dig a little deeper into um, some of the high topics in that area? So if a bank is wanting to kind of partner with um, a fintech, what are some very obvious areas of risk that they do need to be extremely mindful of? Right. So I, what we've done in the past is we've put in what I, what I like to call speed bumps. Um, so in, in a lot of banking as a service arrangements, the technology partner will be going out and selecting the customer, a lot of times selecting the product types, and they'll be onboarding the customer and, and more or less extending loans uh, without much of the bank's involvement at all. Uh, and so the bank uh, might see things after the fact um, it, that they might otherwise object to, um, or they, they might find their hands tied a little bit in terms of their discretion over what the, the product offering looks like and how it's delivered. Uh, and so we put in place some speed bumps where, you know, for example, if you have a deposit customer coming on board, then the, the technology partner is delivering uh, information about the account holder. Uh, it's queued up. The bank can look at who the customer is, make sure that they're okay with the, the know your customer analysis is taking place. And they say, okay, yes, this is a good customer. We'll take them on or, or no, we need more information or no, no, we're just not going to take this, this particular customer. Um, Put a kind of a speed bump in place in terms of new product offerings. We say, okay, um, the fintech group wants to add a new service. Um, well, the bank gets a chance to look at it and approve. Uh, it's a little more collaborative that way. Uh, the other kind of primary speed bump that we might put in there is is underwriting. Uh, so we can we can have the fintech group go do the marketing piece, uh, bring the customer, uh, put together the lending package, and then hand it to the bank, and the bank can say say yes, we're okay with that thumbs up, green light, go ahead. Um, and so that way the bank can kind of see, okay, these are the customers we're getting. We're happy with them. Uh, these are the loans we're getting our books. We're happy with them. Uh, this is our programming. And so there's a better understanding and more transparency about uh, what is happening on, on both sides of the, uh, the arrangement. Yeah. So that really sounds quite awesome. Um, another thing that comes to mind is how can banks prepare for that regulatory scrutiny that is, I feel like is natural for examiners to come in and automatically have if you're partnered and offering a FinTech service? What are some things that the bank needs to do in order to be prepared to, I guess, and survive or get through and properly answer that? Right. right. Great question. So uh, a lot of the output or the understanding that we have from our regulators or the, our are wrapped up in the enforcement actions that you see in the banking as a service space. Uh, take a really careful look at the, the new third party guidance that's come, come out this year and last year, compare it to what you're doing and see if there aren't some weaknesses where, where you might expect some regulatory scrutiny. Um, a specific place you might start is you know, find places where there might be a lack of transparency, uh, lack of the bank's ability to monitor what's going on. Um, yeah errors that are cropping up that, that aren't being followed closely or, or quickly and, and resolved quickly. Th those might be some good, good areas to start that, that I would think. So. Yeah. Cause I, I do feel like that once, at least in my experience, especially in the last couple of years with all the different banks that I get to work with, 
if examiners come in and they find one error in one area, they're going to jump on that and dig as hard as they can. So I definitely can see how staying on top of any errors that are in there and really getting to that root cause would definitely help flush that out and prepare the bank too to have answers to respond to the examiner's questions. It, absolutely. So if you find something, we find that too. Uh, you know, if an examiner's found an error, you know, sometimes if they haven't found anything else during the whole exam, they might be a little excited. And say, oh, well, there's something here. I can, I can do some more, and I can dig some more and find some more problems. Uh, the other thing we like to do is was was with the enforcement actions. Um, the other guidance that comes out is we look over everybody else's shoulder, right? So what, well, what happened there? Um, and let's not do that. <laughs> And so then, then you can hopefully avoid some issues that way as well. Yes, for sure. So I'm trying to think. So what about once you get into an agreement um, with, especially just like your basic banking as a service offering, what about exiting those agreements? If a bank gets to a point where they decide that, oh, maybe it, it is time for maybe we need to move on to something else to help better serve our de demographic. What about that portion of these types of agreements. Right. So I, I think there's a tendency, it's, it's not just banking as a service or fintechs, it's, it's anything, it's real estate, it's investments. All this, everybody on the front end thinks that everything is just going to go great. Uh, there will be no problems, uh, no problems at all. No need to back out. Everybody's going to be happy. Uh, it'll be financially successful and it'll be good. Um, you know, unfortunately, that is that does not always happen. Um, a lot of adjustments need to be made often on uncomplicated structures and complicated arrangements. And sometimes you need to switch partners on the dance floor. <laughs> See that, and and so you need to provide a way uh, for both parties to to say, okay, uh, we need to stop. Uh, how do we unwind this? Uh, how do we shift from this relationship if we need to switch to another bank or a different fintech? How do we do that? Or maybe there's a, a subcontractor who's who's embedded in that relationship. How do we switch that person out? Um, and so you need to think carefully, carefully about, okay, if we pull the plug on this service, what are all the steps that need to occur to make that happen? And then you need to put some provisions agreement that talk about, okay, this uh, bank's responsible for doing this to, to unwind the agreement. The, the fintech's responsible for doing this. And we need to make sure that, you know, if there are deposits that they can be paid out if they need to be. <laughs> so you, you don't want to be in a spot where you have a whole bunch of deposits. You know, they belong to somebody, but you have no idea how to get them to, to where they go. That would be, that would be really an awful scenario. Uh, other thing you want to be aware of, if you have a loan on the books and it's extended for five years or 30, uh, you need to make sure that somebody is there to service that loan uh, and to take care of it throughout throughout its course, because otherwise uh, you're just asking for trouble. <laughs> so. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, future, like looking out towards stuff, I guess, when it is time to kind of, if there are changes that do need to be made, that's a lot to... Look yeah, well into the future for sure. Yeah, well, some, sometimes there are other types of obligations. So you look at your customer agreements. Okay, what which parts of these have a long duration that that need to be accounted for, and which of them can be wound up? And so then you decide. Okay, we make provision for uh, servicing the account for for the duration of the agreement, or do we find it? We put something in the agreement that says we can un unwind this in, in a reasonable way. That's not that's not harmful or abusive. Right. right. And so would you say that as a bank is entering into this type of agreement, and I guess, and just because of this conversation, I'm kind of thinking through. So if a bank is looking to get into one of these agreements that, and it sounds like there should be a pretty heavy weight put on any, like you were saying, untangling, if like an exit kind of clause or verbiage in regards to that, like, it once you, as you're entering, you need to make sure that you do have that type of verbiage in there as well. Is that what I'm understanding? Right. So there, there should be a, a pretty good section. It's not going to be yeah. one provision normally. Um, you know, one thing that banks will be familiar with is their core contract agreements, um, because that is that core processor is so embedded in what the bank does. There, there's always provisions in it for conversion and deconversion and switching. And so you'll see some similar themes that will show up in a banking as a service arrangement um, or or a similar fintech and banking arrangement would take, uh, in some cases, a very similar approach. 
Yeah. And switching gears a little. So customer information and data privacy, all of that has been such a big deal here lately. What are, do you have any advice as far as managing that fintech relationship and the bank taking kind of ownership of that data? Um, have you seen a lot of that go on too in those conversations as well? Oh, oh absolutely. There, There is so much shifting in privacy right now. I mean, just, just nationwide and in Europe and in, in other countries as well. We see, see a lot of states pushing out new new privacy laws. So the one of the, the difficulties with privacy is that there are a lot of hands touching information. And so you, you have to think about, okay, uh, who is going to do what with what information? Uh, is it consumer? Is it payment card? Um, is it is it lending information? Is it is it FCRA? And what it, what are everybody's obligations with respect to that information? Then you think about, okay, well, are they using subcontractors? Are there subcontractors using subcontractors? You need to take think about which information has which types of record keeping requirements, which confidentiality requirements, and you need to make sure that the obligations for maintaining that data is being pushed down downstream. So it's capturing not just the, the fintech provider, but the other people who are in the technology stack. Uh, and there does need to be an effort made to make sure that each of those parties has operationalized those those types of obligations, right? Because I mean, you can write in a contract and say, "Hey, you're going to keep our information confidential." If that subcontractor doesn't know how to do that, uh, then everybody's in trouble. <laughs> it'll, it'll be a problem, right? So there's there some industry standards, things that you can look at. There's a there's a SOC two testing. There's the the ISO. There's some industry uh, international standards organization types of standards that you can meet. Uh, so there are ways to kind of look at that and make sure that everybody's set up to, to do it the right way. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I do want to wrap up with one question, which we always like to ask our listener or our guest, what's one piece of advice you would like to leave for our listeners today? I, I, I like to advise people to, to be cautious, but, but not afraid. Right. So I, I think if you approach a topic and you don't know much about it and you say, because I don't know much about it, I'm not going to engage uh, often you're leaving an opportunity on the table. Uh, but I would say rather than doing that, uh, take the time to inform yourself about the opportunity and make sure you understand the risks and the implications. And oftentimes you, you'll see that that maybe uh, there is a good fit uh, in, in an area where you, you might not have otherwise looked. Uh, banking and services one. Uh, new lending programs is another, there, there are a lot of opportunities, I think for banks, if you just take a minute to look and understand. I think that could be, that could be life advice as well, <laughs> but definitely having all the knowledge and everything before you jump in is, and not being so afraid. I think that's yeah. great. So yeah. thank you, Brent, so much for taking time out of your day to spend with us and talk with us today. Um, and for the rest of our listeners, that's banking matters. Oh, my pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you.